Yes, I would second all these words. These are words of wisdom. However, there are some naysayers, naysayers who say that, well, there's a dangerous world out there. It's a dangerous world with rogue nations. Yes, there are rogue nations, principal among them perhaps the United States of America. It's a dangerous world, they say. In other words, we have to have peace through strength. That's what they say. Well, I say we have to have strength through peace. Now, strength through peace, what does that mean? That means that in the 21st century, you are strong if you have a vibrant economy, if you have much discussions of civil liberties and human rights, if you have vigorous civic life and democratic discussions and a vibrant economy. That is true strength. And it's not strength through war, it is strength that comes through peace. However, there are some naysayers. First of all, they say it's not possible. Human nature, they say, will not tolerate this. Well, look at the situation in Japan. There's some people here from Japan. And in Japan, there is a culture of peace. Mm -hmm. In the United States, in order to get elected, you have to show how tough you are. You have to show what a, what a great key man you are to get elected <coughs> to the United States. In Japan, sometimes it's the opposite. In Japan, the center of gravity, the center of gravity is for peace. You have to show you're for peace in order to get elected in many times in Japan. There's a different culture there. So it's not human nature. We have examples. We have examples of nations that don't have a culture of war, that have, in turn, a culture of peace. And so why is it, therefore, why is it, therefore, that the American people vote for a president with a tremendous military budget? Well, the number one issue in the country right now is Social Security. And the one question that everyone's asking right now is, <laughs> there's no money. There's no money. What about health care? There's no money. There's no money. Well, what I'm telling you now is there's plenty of money. It happens to go to the Pentagon. We have a huge Pentagon budget. But then people say peace through strength. In other words, we have to, the politicians, have to not only take credit for the past, but they also have to show how menacing the future is. My point of view is the politicians will fight progressive change with every tooth and fiber in their body until they realize that it's inevitable, then they take credit for it. <laughs> so therefore, what is it about the politicians that make good, well-meaning Americans peaceful, loving Americans vote for a huge Pentagon budget in spite of all the rhetoric that there's no money for health care, there's no money for Social Security. Well, I think you know the reason. The politicians tend to play with the truth a little bit. And in fact, I have, as a physicist, I have a foolproof test. I tested it out last night <laughs> on the evening news to tell when President Bush is lying. It works every time. As a president, I know that as a physicist, I know the test is, if his lips move, you know he's lying. <laughs> so if you look at public opinion then, so what is it about public opinion? What about the American people? Do they like war or do they like peace? Several years ago, I wrote a book called To Win a Nuclear War, and I had the chance to go through the archives, the archives of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They are some of the most secret documents in the post-war era. I had a chance to go through our war plans, the minutes of the meetings. And during the Korean War, it was quite interesting. During the Korean War, we know that President Eisenhower had plans to drop the atomic bomb on North Korea. It was called Opland 852. I even have a copy of the atomic annex of Opland 852. And in Opland 852, in the atomic annex, we have targets to be vaporized with the use of nuclear weapons. We have minutes of one meeting where Eisenhower goes to the map. He goes to the map and selectively selects targets where nuclear weapons will be used. But then there's a debate, a debate in his cabinet, a debate with the National Security Council. There are voices, the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, being the primary one, saying that we have to use nuclear weapons. And then other people say the American people are not ready. 
So Eisenhower decides to go to the press, and he decides to test the waters, and he makes his famous bombs are bullets speech. It's in the history books. President Eisenhower says that we have to get used to the idea that atomic bombs are like bullets. We use bullets all the time, and it's about time we got used to the idea that atomic bombs are no different than bullets. Well, the next day, I have the minutes of the meeting. The next day, there was a flood of telegrams coming into the White House saying, are you crazy? Have you gone out of your mind? And like Stevenson, we have his telegram saying, you've lost it. Atomic bombs are like bullets. And then I also have the minutes of the meeting that took place after that. Eisenhower comes out and says, you cannot, as he says, as a former general, I know you cannot fight a war when half your people want peace. You cannot fight a war holding up all these telegrams where the American people will not tolerate the use of nuclear weapons. What's the lesson here? The lesson here is that the will of the people, the will of the people, even the politicians, even the politicians have to listen to that. And that's why we're here today. That's what we have to mobilize. That's why we have to keep the spirit of Upton Sinclair alive and well. And just remember that we have minor victories all the time. Mm -hmm. Last month, the Navajo people voted to ban all uranium mining on one of the largest uranium reservations in the continental United States. They voted. I should also point out that the Brookhaven National Laboratory had a document issued years ago stating that certain areas, Native American lands, should be declared a national sacrifice area to preserve the nuclear fuel cycle. Think about that. Native American lands declared a national sacrifice area. I think we should declare the Pentagon a national <laughs> sacrifice area. And then the military has another document. It should be required reading. It's called Vision for 2020. It's on the web. Maybe you've seen it already. I paraphrase the Vision for 2020 of the U.S. Space Command. The head of the U.S. Space Command is now chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In it, it summarizes the last 2,000 years of world history. Why did Rome, why did Rome dominate the world? because its engineers controlled good roads. Good roads meant good logistics mm -hmm. by which you can fight wars with tremendous logistical rapidity and flexibility. The Romans had good engineers. They controlled the land. And then why did the great powers, the great powers of the 1800s, how come they ruled the world? How come the sun never set on the British Empire? Because they controlled the oceans. They had gunboat diplomacy. They control the oceans, rule Britannia. Britannia rules the waves. And then the future belongs to the nation that controls the next frontier, space. So now you know why there's no money. There's plenty of money. It's all going up in a Star Wars program that don't work. In other words, the military is planning for new Rome. That's the catchword among conservatives these days. Talk to any conservative, and they'll talk gleefully about old, but new Rome. My attitude is, what happened to old Rome? <laughs> it fell. And why did it fall? Because of imperial overreach. President Kennedy, uh, Professor Kennedy at Yale wrote a book about this and analyzed the fall of the Roman Empire, the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, the Dutch Empire, why did all these empires rise and fall? Empires, he said, rise and fall in three stages. The first stage, stage one, is when you have a vibrant economy. Rome at the juncture of two great rivers. London with its access to the British Channel. A vibrant economy is stage one. Stage two, the empire is not just content to trade with markets, they want to control them militarily. Rome declares war on Carthage. Rome becomes an empire and starts to take over its neighboring land. That's stage two. Then there's stage three. Stage three is imperial overreach. 
The military is spread so thin, so widely, that it corrupts the economy. It corrupts the spirit of the people. The people begin to bicker. The economy begins to fluctuate and eventually starts to decline. The goose that laid the golden egg, the economy, starts to get devoured by the war machine. And let me ask you a question. What stage are we in? Think about that. And let me land on one last note. Like I said before, there are small victories everywhere we go. The Navajo people have stood up. You also heard that a few months ago, the Canadian people decided to pull out of the Star Wars program. They saw a system that don't work. They realized that a ton of money is going to be wasted. They decided to pull out of the Star Wars program, even though the Canadian government has publicly voiced support for the Star Wars program. They put their ear to the ground, and the Canadian people said, no Star Wars. And that means less money, less initiative for the Star Wars program. And then let me just end on one last note. Of course, we do want a peace department that will hopefully study history the way it should be studied. According to Seymour Hersh of the New York Times, we know that President Nixon had a secret plan to end the war in Vietnam. That's, right. That's why he got elected. That's right. According to Seymour Hersh, we know what that plan was. Mm -hmm. It was called Operation Duck Hook, <laughs> the plan to drop two atomic bombs on North Korea in November of 1969. Operation Duck Hook was in two volumes, a blue cover for volume one and volume two, with a jet aircraft taking off uh, the, sur the surface of an aircraft carrier. Volume two had the atomic annex. In volume two, the appendix had the photographs of the sites where the two atomic bombs would be dropped near the border between North Korea and China. Many people have seen Operation Duck Hook and have since commented to the press about Nixon's secret plan to end the war in Vietnam in November of 1969. So why didn't he drop the bomb? Because in October of 69, two weeks before the November ultimatum, there were a quarter of a million people right. marching in the streets of Washington, D.C., saying, peace now, That's give right. peace a chance. And two weeks later, there was a second demonstration sandwiching, right. sandwiching the November ultimatum another quarter of a million people. And according to Nixon's memoirs, he doesn't mention the atomic annex, but he says, quote, I could not execute right. the November ultimatum because he feared that these people would not be content to march outside the White House lawn. Right. They'd march inside the White House lawn instead. The point I'm raising is something very simple, and that is there's one power more powerful than a hydrogen bomb. There's one thing more powerful than all our nuclear weapons, and that is the will of the people. And if we can tap into the will of people, then we too could have a culture of peace, we too could have a peace department, and we too could then make sure that our swords are turned into plowshares. Thank you.